It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. Yo, man. Oh, Miss Rusty, what is up, everybody? It is Tuesday here in... America somewhere. I don't know wherever you are. Look at that. That looks cool right there, huh? Just gonna I'm gonna let this go down here like this. You guys are watching. You can check it out and be like, yeah, look at this guy. He's cool. Um anyway. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for being here on the Quantum Global Broadcasting Network QG. And I'm your host, Rusty Diamond. Welcome to the Public Access Podcast, the P Podcast. Check out other great shows on the network, such as When the Gloves Come Off, the Thinking Man's Pro Wrestling Podcast. This is it with Lizzie and Saved by the Ben. And the show is brought to you by Fred Ben Savage's Fuck, Stone Reads Productions, Hardcore and Entertainment. Hypnosis is great. And Sock em Up. And you can check that at sockemup.org. S-O-C-K-E-M-U-P dot O-R-G. Uh-huh. 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 So. I want to bring on my special guest today, right here, right now. And right here, right now, we have Alma Thomas. How are you doing there, Alma? Good morning. How are you? I'm doing fine. I'm Good. blessed. I'm Excellent. Favored. And what's that? I said, I'm blessed and highly favored this morning. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What, uh, what what's been what's been going on this morning? Is it are you on the East Coast? Uh yes, I live in um New York on Long Island. I oh, have okay. one child. Where where on Long Island do you what in Copenhagen? Okay, is that near the city? Is that um, more near the close, city? Is... It's yes, it's going towards the city. It's not okay. far that far out east. Yeah, uh, I've been out there a couple of times. I went out there uh, out by I went out by Nassau Coliseum over there, like just barely into on to Long Island, and then I went out and I took the ferry in Port Washington. Is it Port Port Jefferson? Okay, um, okay, I know up where there. that Port, is. Br yeah, Bridgeport to Port Jefferson. I've been out there a couple times, but um, are you are you from Long Island? Well, I was born in uh, Mississippi, but I've been on Long Island for fifty three years. Oh, okay. But did you, so did your parents move up there to uh from Mississippi to Long Island? Yes, my parents and my um moved when uh influx of people. Or leaving the South and coming to the North for better opportunities. So my mom and my grandmother came first, and then my dad came. And so, well, fifty-three years, so like seventy, nineteen seventy, something like that, somewhere in there. Yes, then yeah, so, like sixty-nine. Okay, and so, what what were they doing when when they came up here? What what did they want to do? Did they for a better uh better future for for them and for you what were they do they have anything they wanted to do up here or were they just ready to get they, up here and try it they would just well really um my grandmother moved first and she was doing um days work up here and um she saved her money until she bought a house and then she bought my mom here and then my mom worked for over 30 years at um South Oaks Psychiatric Hospital. Oh wow. Okay. Um so is that what what's the other one? Uh is it uh the the one like in New York? Is it is it Bellevue? Is that right? Um what is it? I remember the name, but it, that one is in the city. This okay, one so this, um, this one's on the island? It's on the island, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then, so did you have any experience with that growing up? Did you ever go see your mom at work or 
did you ever see any of that side of no i never went um to the hospital to see um my mom at work i just know um that she went to the work from like seven to three but i never went a couple of times we went to work with my grandmother because my grandmother eventually um, my grandmother went back to school and became a registered nurse and she worked at um the now defunct Brunswick Hospital she used to work at. Oh well, okay. So, so they I've were been both... to, so I've been to work a couple of times with my grandmother. How how'd that go for you? Were you a kid when you did that? Yes, I was a kid and um my grandmother used to sit us in the hallway in, in the waiting room um, because, you know, you can't, you're not supposed to bring your kids to work with you. So my grandmother would sit us in the waiting room like we was um, <laughs> waiting for somebody else. And we just, she'd tell us, like, sit here and don't move, watch TV or whatever. And then when she came on her break or whatever, she would check on us or she would have uh, her other friends come check on us while um she was working but that didn't happen too often that she would have to leave us there all day but sometimes she would have to take us to work with her and sit us in the waiting room so then i mean let's see so then so you grew up on the island i mean what was what was the island like back then back in you know 70s 80s 90s have you i mean you've been on the island since then like how, yes how i've been progress yes i've been on the island um i attended um high school college um i just went to college on the island i lived on campus to get the campus experience but it was um like 15 minutes away from my house so whenever i got homesick i could come home <laughs> So um, it was really, um, it was a lot safer, like in most places than it is now. Like my mother could tell us uh, we would go outside in the morning and come back in by the time the street lights came on and, you know, run yeah. up and down the streets playing with all the other neighborhood children. So it was a lot safer. I mean, um, since my children grew up, I wouldn't just let them go outside and play by themselves. I would always go out and watch them, but my mom really didn't have to do that. She could um, let us play. And then by the time I got like nine years old, I could stay home by myself. And she would say, don't open the door, don't answer the phone. And we would do that. These kids nowadays would answer the phone, answer the door. But whatever she said, we did it and we were safe. It was, you know, a safe environment. If anything would um, happen, you could go to the neighbors. It was a mixed neighborhood. So I grew up with all diverse people in the community. So it was great. I loved it. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, obviously, if you, you decided to stay there um, after that, you know, to and then be able to raise your kids there. So, I mean, that sounds like a pretty great environment. And then, so your, uh, let's see, what was your mom and grandma, were they, were they still around when your, um, when you had your kids? Did, were they? Yes. yes, my mom is still living. She's um 75 years old and um, she actually, we all live in, the same apartment complex. We have our own yeah. apartments, but um, after I had my stroke, um, I moved over here too to be, you know, closer. So when did you have your stroke? When did that happen? Uh, um, it happened in um, 2021. Okay. And do you remember what was happening when that happened? Well, what happened was, um, I went to work that day. Um, I'm a, um, previously, I was a Head Start teacher. I worked at Head Start for over 30 years as wow. a lead teacher. Um, and then I went to work and um, 
after work, I had a meeting with um, some future authors because um, I was planning on having a master class with people who wanted to be an author. So I met with them and then um, I felt a little funny, but I didn't think, you know, anything was wrong. So I laid down and I had the stroke. And then um, for 24 hours, it was like touch and go. Matter of fact, they called my mom and my daughter and told them that if they wanted to see me alive, that they had to get to the hospital because they were giving me a 1% chance of living. Um, they wanted to hook me up for a ventilator, but they said that when they would try to wake me up from the ventilator, it would be um, only a 10% chance that I would wake up again. So I didn't want the ventilator and- That's um, a good idea. Uh, I'm a, you know, I'm a woman of great faith and God hadn't showed me that I was going to die. So I believe um, that everything was going to be okay. I didn't believe it. Like the, when the nurse asked me, oh, do you want me to call your family so they can be here with you? Um, I was like, no. And she was like, are you mad at your family? I was like, no, I'm just not going nowhere. And they sat me in a, a chair. I remember they used the oil lift and they put me in a chair and they left me there all night because they thought I was going to um, pass away. And when the morning, when the nurse tiptoed into the room, she was like, I was like, excuse me, can you put me back in my bed? I had to sit here all night, uncomfortable. And so they put me back in the bed and... um three days I stayed in ICU and I was ready to be, um, I was no longer in critical condition. So I could be um, downgraded to a regular room. And then um, I stayed in the hospital from April 24th to May 14th. And then I was transferred to a rehab and I stayed in the rehab for almost two years. And I just came home, excuse me. <clears throat> I just came home on um, February 14th. Valentine's Day. Yes, it was the best Valentine's Day present ever. I was so excited to make it back home after were they, that long oh, journey. Were they telling you 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 were going to be discharged soon? Were you, or was it just one day they sort of sprung it on you and said, hey, uh, you, guess what, you're going home today? No, I was fighting to get out of the rehab for months. They kept oh. telling me that I was going to get out soon, but then I needed 24-hour care. And um, so I had to go through the process of getting work. It, um, it was a horrible, horrible experience. And as a person that can talk, and had my senses about me, I was really just concerned, more concerned for patients that don't have a voice. A lot of patients that are in rehab are older people and they don't have a voice and they, they treat you horribly. The place that I was in is supposed to be a five-star place and it was terrible. They would, the water went off a couple of times. They didn't have a backup plan. Um, Whoa. for water, um, I'm allergic to mushrooms, and I was fed mushrooms um twice. They gave me mushrooms, and um, the first time, I was really upset because the nurse saw the mushrooms in the bowl, and she took pictures of the mushrooms, and the um cook immediately when she said, "You know, this patient is not supposed to have mushrooms." The cook said, um, she's lying. There's no mushrooms in the vegetable soup. Then come to find out that the assistant cook had mushrooms left from the previous day. And he just threw them in the soup and didn't tell him that mushrooms was in the soup. And um, I was like, 
he should instead of him immediately calling me a liar, why would I lie about mushrooms being my soup? He should right. have apologized and told me what happened. Like, oh, you know, the um, nutritionist came up and explained what happened. But I was like, he should have came up because he called me a liar. And what reason do I have to lie? So it was really, really a bad experience. Wow. I was attacked four times by another patient that they should have been watching. What was going on there? Um, this um older woman had dementia and she really needed a one-on-one -on -one because she needed to be watched 24 hours. Like she would walk up and down the hallway with her shirt off. Um, she would play in the um the dirty clothes bucket, and we were living in the time of COVID. So they really should have been watching her because she was a danger to herself and others. And then they would say, well, she has the right to be here, whatever. But she would come into our rooms. Um, she would touch our stuff um, and put it down her pants. And once you put it down her pants, you don't want it anymore. Right. And, That's hers. Uh, it's hers now. It's hers, it's hers now. <laughs> and um, a couple times, like a lot, sometimes she would be normal. So, um, you know, I would talk to her or whatever because she was an older woman. So um, she hit me with a soda bottle one day. Um, she hit me with oh. a shoe. And then the last time um, when it was a big to-do, she tr um, grabbed my arm and she dug her fingers down in it. And I was calling for help because I'm bed bound. And this woman, and I didn't want to hurt her because she's an older woman and she wasn't, it wasn't her fault that they really should have been watching her. I blame the hospital, not her, because like I said, they were watching her and leaving her to her own devices. So that was one thing. I had terrible roommates. I had a a racist roommate. Um, I'm 50, um, eight years old and born in a deep, deep South. And I've never been called the N word before until she used it. So, um, it was a bad experience. <clears throat> um, I would, um, never go back to that nursing home and that got to the point where I wanted to be, if they couldn't send me home, I wanted to be transferred to another nursing home. Sure. And so what was the first thing you did when you got out? Once you once you got outside the doors of the place, what's the first thing you did? Um, well, I got um transferred home and um uh ambulat and my daughter um had came to the hospital to um take me home and she, we were just excited because um so many times we was told that I was going home and oh. um so you know at first she didn't have her hopes up too high because she had been waiting um so long for me to come home so when we came home you know I just got um accustomed to being at home and they had before I got there um, they had sent all my stuff here, so I had all the things that I needed. So I was just happy um, to be home. Yeah, I bet. And after two years, and did you get COVID while you were in there? Yes. What, how many times? Um, I got it once. And um, the thing is that... It's so, um, what was so upsetting about it was that they knew that my two aides had COVID, were out with COVID. So when I came down with COVID system, symptoms, um, they ignored me for a week. Um, they refused to give me the COVID test until an old, uh, another man went to the hospital and then they had to test everybody. And then they're going to call my family and say, oh, we were doing random testing and your sister came up positive. But my family knew that wasn't right. They knew I was positive. 
for the whole week because I was complaining. Like all my symptoms, I had all my symptoms. It wasn't um, that bad. It was just like a bad case of the flu, but they refused to give me anything. And then once they, um, the week was over, a whole week they found, they moved me, they came and said they had to move me to the COVID unit. And then they tried to give me the uh, antibiotic um, IV and I refused it because by that time I was feeling better. I was like, y'all are not putting anything in my body and I'm over it now. When I was really bad and um, feverish and all that stuff, y'all didn't give me anything. And now y'all, are, you know, y'all didn't take me seriously. Yeah. Um, they, you know, treat you like a child. And I was like, if I tell you I don't feel good, I'm not telling you I don't feel good not to go to physical therapy. I'm not in third grade and trying to get out of going to school. If I don't want to go to physical therapy, I'm just going to tell you I'm not going. Right. Yeah. And it's not like you're, you know, you're you know, acting, you know, saying that you, you'll go, but then, you know, acting like you're saying, I don't want to go. And that's, 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 that's fine. Okay. So I can tell you that I don't yeah. want to go, but if I tell you that I don't feel good and um, y'all refuse um, to take this, like um, one day they left me, matter of fact, I went on Facebook and this is when they, I left, they left me and um, my own urine and feces for 72 hours. And Whoa. I bet- Eventually, I went on Facebook and put them on blast. Like, I'm at Park Avenue Nursing Home. Well, this is the number. Would y'all please call and tell somebody to change me? And all my friends started calling. So the late the nurse that was on charge on duty is going to be more concerned about me being on Facebook than no one actually changing me. And then they're going to try to tell a, tell a story and say that they changed me. Um, and I said, pull the cameras and you'll see how many times somebody went in my room, pull the cameras. And then once I became very vocal about the way I was being treated, and then not only myself, but saying what's happening to the people who can't talk. If y'all are doing this to me and I can talk and voice my concerns, what are you doing to the other people who can't talk for themselves? So then they really, you know, got upset with me because um, uh, a lot of my friends, then they tried to say that my friends was calling them up and cursing them out and threatening them. And I said, that's just not be. true because um, I don't hang out with people that are thugs and that's going to call you and curse you out. You have, I have legislative friends. I have pastor friends. These people are calling you and telling you all to do your job. And you're trying to cover your tracks by telling stories. And they talking about, you know, that um, when the, um, the Department of Health would come, they would know when the Department of Health was coming. And you would see them fixing things. And the days that the state was here, they had extra people on. But I was like, if you can find people and you can do what you're supposed to do when the state is coming, why can't you do it all the time? And the state is not supposed to call you up and say, hey, I'm coming. If a robber called you up and said, you know, I'm going to burglarize your house um, tomorrow, you would make sure that they couldn't get in you would you would be prepared so it's the same way with the state when the state comes they're preparing for the state because the staff is the staff is not allowed to say anything like they're not allowed to tell you that they're short staffed and whatever but um i had a few people on staff that being there so long and you know, uh, treating people as people. I had people that were my friends, so they would come and tell me stuff, but, um, you know, I would never want to get them in trouble and say, so-and-so said that, but, you know, they would tell me the really going ons, like we're short staff. And I said, it's better to say you're short staff 
then somebody ring their bell and you don't answer them for two right. hours. And it's like you're ignoring them, but really you're short staffed and trying to get to 33 patients and there's only two of y'all on the floor. Whoa. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really understaffed for that kind of, uh, for that kind of care. I mean, that's, yeah, that's pretty wild. That, that's yes. that much. Like when I came wow. there, when I first came there, um, they had like five people on every floor um, for just about every shift, except for the 11 to 7 shift. The 11 to 7 shift was terrible, but the rest of the shifts, they had adequate people. And But as the mandates came down that everybody had to have the COVID shot and all this, a lot of people, and a lot of people left the, the healthcare field fill, just as they left the educational field, you know, in fear for their lives or didn't want to have the COVID, whatever it was that it dwindled down and down. And then now you have three or two people doing the same job that you once had five people doing. That's going to make <laughs> life pretty difficult for yes. a lot of people. Then, so, I mean, so who's, who now is speaking for the people who can't speak? Is there, were you able to kind of get some light shed on that to be able to have some more people be able to advocate for these people or no, what? You know, no, because I'm writing a book about it now, but about okay. my experience, but even we called the attorney general that things got so bad, we called the attorney general, we talked to him and told him everything, but it's like these people um, are in their pockets or, you know, doing something. I don't know what it is because, they, you know, you tell them these stories and of what's going on and it's like they ignore you. It's like even when the health, the, the state came, one of the representatives came in my room and I was telling her that I didn't have a bell for three weeks, that I had to call on the telephone or have my sister or my mom or somebody call to the hospital to get somebody to come to my room because my bell wasn't working. Um, right while the state was there, they fixed my bell. So if you can fix it so quick, um, why is it? that it wasn't fixed until the state came but I was telling them everything that was happening and the thing was that um, they would do just enough to get by like some nights we didn't get our medication and um, I was there because I had a stroke so my blood pressure had to be monitored very closely but they um, wouldn't give me my medication but they would sign off that I had it. So they would try to make me think I was crazy that I forgot that they gave me my medicine, but they never gave it to me. And then when the nurse would come for the morning shift, she would know that I didn't have my medication because my blood pressure would be high. So their answer to that was they put a patch on me um, until I was ready to go, but I was allergic to the patch. And for weeks I told them, that I was breaking out from the patch and they never tried to come up with another solution until I went home because they was like, they, oh, we can give you your medicine an hour before, an hour after. I said, an hour before what? Because you're giving me the, my medicine at all different times or not giving it to me. And the nurse is signing off that she gave it to me. And y'all are saying a lot of people are having the same um problem so why would we all be lying how could we all be not telling the truth and why would we not tell the truth um it's not like we're trying to na 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 boo boo get y'all in trouble for things that y'all are not doing y'all are not doing these things and these conditions are happening and y'all are overlooking it it's like yeah. um it's like they oh, the elderly 
are not that important, but everybody in the nursing home is not elderly or can't talk. You know, um, the one thing I never lost when I had my stroke was my cognitive ability. So I understood what was going on around me. And um, like I said, they tried to cover it all up. So, I mean, do they have a lot of people in there? They must have a lot of people in there that have lost their cognitive ability and probably, like you're saying, probably can't aren't able to speak up. And then it sort of becomes the the norm of how they can treat people. Am I, yeah, like, does that sound uh, sort of like it? One of the nurses, they, I was talking to her and she was telling me um, that on another floor, you know, they, I was telling, no, no, I was telling her that <clears throat> this lady that was there, she was refused to go in her room. So for three weeks, she sat up in her wheelchair all day and all night. So eventually um, she had to go to the hospital. But before she went to the hospital, one night I heard her screaming that you hitting me, you hitting me, don't hit me because um, my daughter is a lawyer. And so um, I was telling that to another nurse and she was like, that lady probably did hit her because she's known for hitting people. So I said, well, why don't somebody say something? I said like, I'm a teacher and if my teacher's assistant or aide, I saw them hitting a child, if I don't say anything, it's just like I hit that child if I try to cover it up. And she was like, you know, if you say anything or it's like you're a troublemaker, you, you know, the other aides refuse to help you and all these things when you need help. And I was like, wow, you know, that y'all know this is going on on other floors there you know, hitting people and abusing people. And I was like, I heard that lady screaming that um, that lady hit her when she brought her in the bathroom. And, you know, she told her, you know, no, I didn't hit you. No one hit you. And they made it seem like that lady was losing her mind. But in actuality, that lady, real, that nurse's aide really hit her. But, you know, the the ones that are getting hit um, can't voice their opinion. And then they're saying, you know, unless you give them a name of who told you X, Y, and Z, that, you know, that's hearsay. But, so. Their word against the nurse's word. And, um, yeah, that's really messed up um so were were you writing books before you had the stroke yes or did you okay so you were already writing um and so this newest book you're writing is going to be about is it going to start at the stroke or where it starts where at the, you, <laughs> excuse me it starts at the stroke and it talks about symptoms of having a stroke and the medical concern things. And then I talk about my personal experiences through having a stroke, the part about the nurse thinking that I was going to die and asking me, did I want her to hold my hand Why I transitioned? Like, and I really don't think that's anything that you say to a patient, but anyway, um, and to my sister, um, because um, when I was in the first hospital, I signed the DNR and, you know, my family was against it. So they were thinking I had to stroke. I wasn't in my right mind, but I was in my right mind because it's not that I wanted to die. It's just that I didn't want to live um, as a vegetable. With with that, with that quality of life, right? Right, you and, know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, uh, I, I have that in my my will too. I mean, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, you know, it's I, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, then when I got to 
um, the nursing home, um, I took the DNR back because um, it was just in that instance. And I felt like, you know, in this place, they would just, they, they would make me, let me die or oh, whatever. So, um, but, so that's what the book starts with, um, talking about um, a stroke and my personal experience and how, and encouraging other people through my faith. Um, my faith is what kept me going. My faith is, you know, how I endured all these hardships and I still, you know, maintain my integrity. I didn't curse people out. Um, I treat the nurses, they like me because I treated them like people and understood. I was like, just tell me, like, you know, when you're short staffed or whatever. And I wouldn't bother them for little things. They, you know, they would only have to come into my room once or more than if, you know, if I, you know, needed to be changed, I could verbalize that. So I would only call them when it was necessary or I wouldn't want, I wouldn't just call them for petty things or whatever. So right. um, the book is talking about <coughs> all of that. And then it, it, you know, ends up with talking about the healthcare system and what needs to d be done to reform the healthcare system because um, it's like the elderly are the lowest on the totem pole. And it's like, you know, you think, oh, well, they're gonna, you no, know, they live their life, but you wanna live out your last days um, with dignity and respect. You, you know, you don't wanna be overlooked and mistreated during your latter years. Because everybody, either you're going to die young or you're going to have to get old. So you have to treat people the way you want to be treated on the way you I remember um, going on Facebook and showing a picture of a banana that I was served. It was all brown. The whole banana was brown. And I asked people, would you serve this to your mother? And all, yeah. you know, everybody was saying, no, 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 no. And I was like, this is what I was served this morning. And I, you know, once I asked for milk and the four times that they sent the new milk up, it was spoiled. Wow. And yeah, just, I mean, is it, they just don't notice or they just, do you think they just don't care or what were it? Or a mi mixture of both? I think it was a mixture of both, you know, it is some people, like I had some excellent, excellent aides, and then I had some people who were just there to get a check. It's just like um, going through this experience to me was just like working with young people. When you're working with um, children and elderly, you're working with people, you're, you're over people's lives. It's not like you're making boxes for a living, but you're making lives. So you're going to have a positive or a negative impact. You're going to have influence one way or the other with children. And as I learned, you know, going through this experience, it's the same way with elderly people. You can't just work with kids for the money and you can't work with the elderly just for the money. You really have to have compassion and um, think about one day you're gonna get old. Like I treated my kids for 32 years like they were my biological kids. Um, I remember before I had this stroke, I was in the hospital for like a week and I was so concerned because it was the first time I'd ever left my kids for a week. Like I never took my vacation during the time when kids would the, the kids were there because I always wanted to be with my babies. They were like my kids, like my 17 kids. As a matter of fact, um, um, 13 years ago, I lost my biological son. He passed away from a heart attack 
And the only thing that got me through that period in my life was the kids in my classroom giving me a purpose to want to come get up in the morning. My daughter giving me a purpose to want to get up in the morning. And because if not, I would have just crawled into a shell and, you know, passed away. I remember um, a couple of months after he passed away, it was his first heavenly birthday. And um, I wanted to take um, some overdose of my high blood pressure pills because I wanted to be with my son on his first birthday in heaven. And, um, you know, I heard a still voice saying, if you do this, you'll never see him again. And I put the pills back down and I began to turn my pain into um, a purpose, my, uh, my pain. And I started a scholarship in his name. And I just, um, the two years that I was in the hospital, I have been given it, but um, up to date, I've given away 20 scholarships to um, African-American boys um, who live with single parents and, you know, it's enough to cover their books or whatever. So, um, you know. Awesome. Yeah, then, wow. Um, so was that part, did that end up, I mean, so what we were writing about before your stroke, was that one of the, the subjects you were yes you wrote I, about um <clears throat> excuse me my first um book is called dream killers and um my second book is called from the waiting room to the recovery room so i originally started writing from the waiting room to the recovery room first but i could never finish that book and um one day over the summer in 2016, someone asked me to write a uh, magazine article. So I began, I was like, you know, let me just look through something that I wrote that was never published and turned it in. But then um, God dropped in my spirit, dream killers. So I said, what are you talking about, God? What are, what are you trying to say to me? And he was like, um, you never could finish from the waiting room to the recovery room because you're still in the waiting room. You allow dream killers, um, fear your past, um, to keep you, um, in that waiting room. I've called you out of the waiting room. I've called your name, but you're listening to the voices around you. You can't hear me. And I wrote dream killers and a week and I had that Whoa. book published. and then right after I wrote Dream Killers, I was able to finish from the waiting room to the recovery room. So those are both um inspirational books. And then um I'm in a, a number of anthologies. Matter of fact, the first thing that I published was an anthology. I was on Facebook and a publisher Chanel Williams from Shawshank Publishing um, plug um, was um, looking for people to write in her book. And so I contacted her and said, did you ever write anything before? So I was like, I've written thousands, thousands of things, but I've never published anything before. So our book was on love, marriage, and divorce. And I was the first one to contact her so I had the choice of you know either one of the three so I picked divorce and I was going through a divorce at that that time so I was gonna just write about safe um people in the church getting the divorce and the stigma behind it and whatever whatever because I'm a minister so um getting divorced you know people view it differently. So um, when I began to write the book, it went a whole nother direction. It was the first time that I wrote a fictional story. 
and the book was published. And when I felt I held the book in my hand, it was like the first time that you're in labor, and after labor, you hold your baby, and the joy that you feel from holding your newborn baby. I equate that to how I felt after the book um, was published. And from then on, I've been in like 10 to 15 anthologies. Um, I have the two solo books. I'm working on um, three new books that I have. One is the inspirational book about having a stroke. And um, I'm writing another book, um, Never Was um, Daddy's Little Girl. And that's about fatherlessness in America and the impact that it has on children. You know, I beat the odds by being um, a product of a single family home and I went to college and I have two degrees, one and one secular degree in human uh, children and family services and then one Christian um, degree, um, a bachelor's of science and Christian studies. Um, so, you know, I beat the odds. I had only had two kids and um, I put them through and then me also being a single parent, um, I put my children through private school. Um, my son was um, getting ready to go to college when he passed away and he was gonna um, be a lawyer. He was in pre-law school. And now my daughter, she's 21 and um, she's going to school to um, be a lawyer. So she's in her second year of college now. So I feel like, you know, all the odds were stacked against me, but I persevered. Um, you know, I remember going to college with, um, I had dropped out of college the first time and I began to work and got excited about working and didn't go back to college for like 10 years. And I remember bringing my son to class with me. Um, I remember working two jobs and going to school um, full time. I was taking 12 credits and um, at night, instead of us coming home from my second job, we would go to the library um, from like six to nine. Um, the library in my community had a cafe in it and um, we would eat dinner at the cafe whatever things they had, like pizza, tuna fish, um, for a whole year while I was getting my education. Um, I was taking my son to school with me, to class with me. I would, you know, tell the professors, you know, he'll be quiet. He'll just color in his coloring book. And he was a good kid. So he would go to the library or wherever I was at class. And he would sit there and color in his book and they would use him as examples. If it was a child care, care class, they would use him as examples because he was in, it was a real child in the room. So, um, you know, I went through a lot in my life, a lot of obstacles, a lot of hurdles, but I didn't let anything stop me. I'm still here. I'm still like, um, when you asked me, when I told you I was bedridden, and you was like, well, you're going to still do the interview. And I was like, yes, of course. I do it from my bed. I do my podcast from my bed because my podcast is called Live Again. And a lot of times after you've been through a traumatic experience, the loss of a child, the loss of a relationship, the loss of your limbs, you have to, you go through the grief process just like, when you lose someone, um, you know, I went through all the steps of the grief process when I lost my son and when I had the stroke, you go through denial, you go through bargaining with God, um, you go through depression. And finally, <clears throat> you get to the stage of acceptance and you have to accept your life 
as it is. You can't live in how what you used to do. You have to um be. What am I trying to say? Um, you can't put your purpose in life on pause. I started my podcast, like I said, um, I was in a hospital when I started my podcast. I was still in rehab. But like I said, you you can't put your purpose on pause. And after you've been through a life-defying moment of, wow, I really, you know, am mortal that you don't have long hair on earth. So you have to do everything that God has called you to do, you have to do it in that time period. In that time period be- between when you are born and when you die. You don't want to die with any of your purpose inside of you. So it, when you go through that life defying moment, you decide to live, you give yourself permission to live life to the fullest. That's what live again is about giving yourself permission to live again. I had to give myself permission to live again after my son passed away. I had to give myself permission to live again after I had a stroke or I could have had a pity party and like, oh, I can't walk, I can't do this, but um, I thank God that he never took my cognitive abilities or my ability to speak so I can still from my bed, from my wheelchair, I can still empower and inspire people to live again, to accept your life as it is now and live your best life. That whatever you're still capable of doing, do that thing. Don't rely on yesterday, what I used to can do yesterday. You think about what can I do today? What can I do today to make my community better? What can I do to be the change that I want to see? It's the same thing about the the nursing home. Even though I'm home and I'm safe, there's still people living in unsafe conditions. And I want to ring the bell and shout it loud that these people's lives matter. That's great. That's quite admirable. And I like that. And um, just like... Uh, I don't know. You're probably the sixth or seventh person I've uh, I've had on here from uh, the crew, and I I've really liked all of you that have been on. And I keep saying like, you got anyone else? Like, bring them on. And I'm uh, happy you got to come on here, and uh, we got to talk, not knowing where we we're gonna go, and yeah, getting to to hear your story and. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate it. I'm happy we got to meet. And um, thank you again for that. And Yes, thank you for yeah. inviting me because every platform that I can be on and share my story and talk about health care and reform and um, like the, the crew podcast, I thank God for the, the crew because we're like a family. We, you know, live all in different places, but we're there for each other to build each other up, to um, empower each other, to love on each other. So um, the group podcast has grown to be um, a part of my life and a part of my healing process because they encouraged me to go on because at first um, I didn't want to do the podcast um, because I was like, you know, oh, I, you know, signed up to be in it when I thought I would be out of the hospital. And when the crew started, like I said, I was still in the rehab. But uh, I said, wait, you know, you're telling people you can't put your purpose on pause. So you can't put your purpose on pause. You have to, you know, get your story out there. So once and, again, you know, thank you. For, enjoy, for inviting me to be on your platform so I can, you know, my my um, purpose in life is just to share my story of how against all odds you can make it, that if you're determined, um, there's an old saying 
that I say all the time. If your heart, if your, wait, no. If your mind can conceive it and your heart can believe it, then you can achieve it. So anything that you get in your mind and, and you want to do, you can do it. If you see yourself doing it, you visualize yourself doing it, you can do anything. And I'm a living example of against all odds of losing a child and I'm still standing. I'm going through a fire and I'm still standing. Um, the loss of a relationship, getting a divorce and I'm still standing and having a stroke and I'm still standing, I'm still pushing um, forward. Um, I'm unstoppable. And so where can everybody find you? I think we've gone over a lot of it where they can find you on the internet with your podcasts and your books. Um, so where, I mean, if you wanna recap that or if you wanna say other places where they can find you or. Yeah, well, you can, yeah, that's basically, you can find me on Facebook as Alma Thomas and every um, third, first and third Wednesdays, um, you can listen to my podcast the Live Again podcast um, with the crew, the crew, hallelujah, you can listen to me and find out who, the guests that I have, all people who can empower you to live again, that after anything, any circumstance, any situation, you can soar above it. You can soar above like an eagle, you can soar above your circumstances and live again. So, well, yeah, thank you so much, Alma. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you being here and enjoyed getting to thank meet you and talk with you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, hopefully we'll stay in touch and yeah, and hopefully you have a great rest of your day. All right. You too. You be blessed. And I would love to come on your show again. When I finish my book, um, Surviving a Stroke and Living Through Park Avenue. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, give, give me give me a little bit of heads up uh, for that. And uh, so I'll get you a book either at the right time. Like when you think you're wrapping it up, yeah, give, give me a send me a message and we'll get you on here. All right. OK, thank you. Right. Thank yep. you. Yep. Take care. Okay. Thank you too. All right, that's Alma Thomas. So, yeah, dude, dude, check her out. And Alma, uh, sorry for the swear words that are in the thing. I forgot. Um, yeah, but I guess it's part of the intro and outro. So I try not, not not to swear during this, and I hope I didn't. But. Yeah, like I said, everyone I've had on, on from the, the crew podcast has been been great, and uh, all authors and yeah, or all podcasters, and yeah, just uh, a good good crew to know. So, you guys, thanks so much for listening. Uh, leave a message, you guys. It's cool if you want to leave a message. I'll play it on the air. You know how it goes. Five zero three nine seven four six four twenty. Leave a message, or maybe you don't want to, and you're like Ernest. You're not like that. I guess I I messed up, and it's like messages, messages. Yeah, uh, man, you're getting the the outro. What's working today? I don't know. But you guys, thanks for listening here on the QGBN. Uh, again, check out other shows on the network, and thank you to our sponsors, Fred Ben Savage as fuck. I guess I had to swear right there with the name of that. But it's like a bunch of letters and symbols instead of that last word. Um, Stoner East Productions, Hardcore Entertainment, Hypnosis is Great, and Sock em Up. And that's S-O-C-K-E-M-U-P dot O-R-G to check it out. Thank you guys so much. Like, share, subscribe. And that is the show, man. Boom.
It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. Ernest! 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 <coughs> yes, Pee-wee. You brought the snacks, right? 